Yes, yes, sir. Thank yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm here. So if uh, we are okay, we can uh, begin the session. Christina, yes, you are with us? Yes. Yes, yes hello. Hello, Didier. Hello, uh, Hasrat. Good morning, Christina. And uh, hello, everybody, all the participants to this uh, technical session. Thank you. I'm here. At any time you want me to uh, take the floor, Didier, please just ask. Okay, so as co-chair, normally you have to give the floor to the different uh, expositor. So yes. I will give uh, five minutes only for presenting the session this afternoon. And after I will give you the floor for giving the floor to each uh, person after. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for being here, everybody. So this afternoon we have a session about uh, agriculture in mountains and mainly to talk about uh, agrobiodiversity with different uh, focus on issue about uh, a description, a background of, on what is uh, really agrobiodiversity. A first example with my presentation in the Andes, and after we will go to other presentation, one with uh, Dr. Sonia Vanovska, from North Macedonia about uh, to complete my presentation about the concept about uh, agricultural biodiversity. And then we will go to the Himalaya with uh, Dr. Balkrishna Joshi. And he will explain us uh, the importance to have metrics to evaluate, to assess the dynamic of agrobiodiversity in C2. And he will have, uh, he will present another lecture about um, seed selection, seed bank, and the importance to connect to indigenous to conserve the local seeds. And at the end of the session, we will have a presentation from uh, Mrs. Caroline Ledon from Italy about uh, farmer rights. So we can begin, Christine. Okay. So uh, as you are the first speaker, yeah, please uh, uh, try to um, give the participants uh, the uh, information that you prepared with regards to sustainable agriculture and the mountains linking agricultural biodiversity conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. So I've shared my screen. Everybody can see my screen now. Yes, it's clear, it's, it's visible. Clear. Thank you. So during my lecture, I will talk about uh, agriculture in mountain, and I will give you an example about uh, Andean agriculture with the example of quinoa. I am a French researcher working at CIRAD. CIRAD is a French agricultural research center for international development. And we have a mission of uh, international cooperation. And we have researchers based in more than 100 countries all around the world, working with farmers, farmer organization, and national research. In my presentation, I have three parts. The first part is to discuss what is really biological diversity. The second part to put a focus on agrobiodiversity. And the third part of my lecture about Kino case study in the Andean mountains. So the key concepts I want to share with uh, the trainers this afternoon is about uh, the concept of biodiversity, foregoing evolution of nature and different aspects of evolution, the link between agrobiodiversity and plant genetic resources the different dimension of biodiversity and especially cultural biodiversity, as uh, Dr. Parvi said this morning. And I will talk about also ecosystem approach for agroecosystems, the importance to consider crop rights relatives in mountains and uh, the process of domestication before expansion of uh, neglected crops all around the world. So the third part of my lecture is about biological biodiversity. And the different objective of this part is to describe the immensity, the complexity, 
and the need to take a new look at the balance of the planet. So what is biodiversity? It is the diversity of life around the world, and we can uh, <clears throat> estimate that millions of species more only unknown. And in the different groups, for example, for virus, we only know one in five thousand of species already described but the estimation of uh, the number of virus in this group is more than 500 million so we know nearly nothing about this group it's different for vertebrate for example because the estimation of the species already described is more or less 45,000 and the estimation of the species to be described at the global level is more or less 50,000 million. So, so it is uh, not the same for the different group. And we have to maintain in our mind that uh, the number of species doesn't explain the totality of the biodiversity. And we need to know the function of the species in the ecosystem. And what is biodiversity for the evolution? The description of the different species come in the last 70s, 80s centuries with a botanist Linnaeus, who describe the what is species and belong to the same species, all living beings that resemble each other to receive the same name. And that gives the Latin binomial name for every species, for example, Pantera leolineus for the lion. But with the description of the evolution with Darwin's transformers in the 19th centuries, we develop another natural classification that become the family trees of life. And for Darwin, belong to the same species, all the individuals which take two by two have in natural condition a probability to generate at least one fertile descendant. So it is completely different. And we put the name of the species only in a tree of the evolution. And we conserve this definition of species until today. For example, the most known example of Darwin is about the Darwin fishes in the Galapagos with the evolutionary radiation from one original species, they develop four big types for a total of 13 species that appear in the same island. So from one species, we can develop some characteristic as adaptation to the environment. And this uh, source of evolution comes from the variability, from the genetic variability as source of diversity. And for describing this biological diversity, species isn't enough for describing this uh, genetic variability. And we need to explain more in depth the different population and the individuals in the population. And now we are more describing the relationship between population, environment, and systems. So this notion of specific diversity comes and develops the function of the relative abundance of species in addition to the numbers. And we develop some uh, indices for describing this diversity, for example, the indices of Simpson, of Shapson, and I think our colleague from Nepal will explain these indices in the next uh, presentation. So I will not explain them here. And we can describe this genetic variability by the difference between phenotype, that is the expression of the genes, versus the genotype, like is DNA. And the mutation in DNA and the natural genetic diversity could explain the difference for selection and adaptation. And we need to understand these two differences for adapting new varieties to new condition of environment. So the concept of biological diversity is very recent. And biodiversity is a contraction of biological diversity. It's an expression designating the variety 
and the diversity of the living world. And in a broader sense, this world are most synonymous of life on Earth. And the first time we discovered this concept was in uh, 1980 with Lovejoy. And after, in 86, Wilson contract these two words for giving the terms biodiversity and the Convention of Biological Diversity during the Earth Summit in Brazil in 92 was the beginning of the reutilization of this concept of biodiversity. So for the Convention of Biological Diversity, Biological diversity has been defined as the variability among living organisms from all sources, including inter alia, terrestrial, marine, and the aquatic ecosystem and the ecological complexes of which they are part. This includes diversity of species between species and of ecosystems. And we need to consider the multiple levels of organization for understanding what is really biological diversity. And the three main components are genetic diversity or genes, specific diversity for species and ecosystem diversity for ecosystem or biome. But also as it has been considered in the article HG of the CBD, the cultural diversity is very important. And for us in agriculture, this cultural diversity is very important because we need to consider all cultural practices by farmers in the different agroecosystem. But we need to understand also the difference between white species and domestic biodiversity from domestication processes, spatial and topological dimensions. So there are multiple levels of organization that we need to consider for understanding what is really biological diversity. And that explains this stability and the different extension crisis, because now we can see five massive extinctions during the time. And now we're <clears throat> talking about the sixth extension from the Anthropocene. And the emblem of the current erosion is the example of the bird, the dodo, is a bird from Mauritius became extinct toward the end of the 17th century after humans destroyed the forest where the birds nested and introduced animals that ate their eggs. And there are different causes of biodiversity loss, but the most important of them are mal implicated from fragmentation of habitat, destruction of ecosystems, or pressures on ecosystems with other degradation and standardization. Another point, important point, is about climate change that can influence ecosystem by altering biodiversity and hold the concession for humanity. But for, there is also many interests and controversies on biodiversity because biodiversity could be a reservoir of industrial products. And there are many aspects about access to plant genetic resources of genetic resources. It is why we are talking about common heritage of humanity, like uh, Parvi said before with the Secretary of the GIS at FAO headquarters. And we need to discuss about intellectual property rights and farmer rights. And the CBD is not enough for talking about all this aspect. That is why we need to discuss through the inter international treaty about uh, domestic species. If we go more in depth about agrobiodiversity, the importance of agrobiodiversity is it is why it is a human creation. And without uh, human creation, the emergence of cultivated place, plants, domestication could not be. And the relationship of agriculture to environment is very important. And this agrobiodiversity is a form of valorization of biodiversity. And we need to understand the notion of agroecosystem to understand the ecological services of agriculture to preserve the major balances of the planet. What is agrobiodiversity? Biodiversity in agriculture or agrobiodiversity refers to all plants and animal breeds in agriculture. They are wide relative, 
their species of origin and the species that interact with them, for example, pollinator, symbiote, parasite, predators, as well as the full range of environments in which agriculture is practiced, not only arab or cultivated field. So, it first encompasses the variety and variability of living organisms that contribute to food and agriculture in a broader sense. So, agribusism includes chains, populations, species, community, ecosystems, and landscape components, as well as human interaction with them. It is also include many habitats and species outside the agricultural system that benefit agriculture and enhance the function of the cultivated ecosystem. But generally, when we are talking about agrobiodiversity, we put a focus on plant genetic resources and we reduce the agrobiodiversity to this uh, issue. And, but plant genetic resources include only the diverse plant genetic material contained in the traditional varieties and modern cultivars, as well as wide variety of, cultiv of cultivated species and all the wild plant species that can be used now and in the future for food and agriculture. So agricultural biodiversity is important at the three levels of biodiversity, at ecosystem level, at species level, and at chain level. And each of the three levels participate in the sustainability of agrarian system and answer the productivity. But the process of agrodiversity comes from the domestication of cultivated plants to modern agriculture. And it was not possible without an initial knowledge of hunter-gatherers, with daily observation of plants and animals, cultivation at the beginning of source farm plants that they need. And we need three conditions of the beginning of agriculture. Men already settled in villages, they knew how to sow in order to harvest, and they were already specialized in the gathering of species, which will be later domesticated. And from the domestication of cultivated plant to modern agriculture for more than 10,000 years, the world agricultural community have developed agricultural plant genetic resources in five centers of farm, most important centers of origin in the Near East with barley and wheat, in Southeast Asia with rice, in the Andes with potato, in Africa with millet and sorghum, and in Central America with corn. But the most important thing about creating diversity in agriculture is that plant genetic resources were collected and exchanged for more than 1,100 years. And the propagation will be with the human migration, with improvement of cultivar according to local context and use and cultivation of a large, large, large number of species. And agriculture has always been based on access and exchange, not on exclusivity. And it is one important thing because it is only from the last uh, 50 or 70 years that we are developing some legal regulation that uh, not permit the exchange of seed uh, among farmers. And the use of cultivation of large seeds is very important, but also the diversity within each of them. And for example, here we have an example of potato in the Andes, because farmers domesticate the original white plants, add to diversity by adapting the cultivated plant to new ecosystem, human need, and discover new crops from crop wise relative with intercrossing, possible intercrossing. So today, we know more than 700 species of plant consumers in the world, but only 100 with a significant importance because they result more than 90% of the world's food crops. And today, on these main cultivated plant species, only 12% of them provide nearly 75% of our food and wheat, rice, and corn alone provide 60% of the calorie in the food we eat. So this evolution of weakened agriculture and impoverished the quality of our diet. The main specificity of our globality is that the value of agricultural genetic resources lies as much in the infrastructure specific diversity as in a number of species. 
and farmers contribute to increasing diversity through production system. But when the system dies, diversity must be conserved ex situ. Countries and regions are interdependent. All depend on crops originating from other countries. And most of the plant genetic resources, plant genetic resources are found in tropical and semi-tropical countries, not in the industrial north. But for ma to maintain agrobiodiversity, it requires management and human active and continued management. So it is important to consider farmers, farmer organizations to do this job. And if we go to some example of quinoa in the Andes, the quinoa was only in the Andes for over 7,000 years. And the potential of quinoa was rediscovered during the second half of 20th century, during the internal year of quinoa. Quinoa's biodiversity and high nutrition value can play a role providing global food security. But what is quinoa? Chedopodium quinoa is from the Amatoase family. It runs from for its icons and it is closely related to beets, peanuts, and common land squatters. But what is important? When we can see this uh, quinoa and its center of origin in the South America, between uh, Peru and Bolivia, around the Lake Titicaca, we have different uh, uh, crop world, quinoa crops are relative around the world. And the first one is in South America, Kenopodium hircinum, and it has been considered as weed for this region. In North America, we have two quinoa crops relative. The first one is Kenopodium bernandieri, that is considered as a weed in USA and Canada. But we have another one, Kenopodium bernandieri in Italia, that is, be, that is cultivated in Mexico now. And in other parts of the world, we have also another crop variety, Kenopodium album in Europe. And in Europe, it is only a weed. But in Asia and in some part of the Himalaya, this Kenopodium album is cultivated today. So it is interesting to see the different quinoa crop varieties could have some links for the development and the expansion of the crop. Quinoa is known today for the important balance of all essential amino acids that uh, cover all the requirements of FAO. The importance of Kenopodium quinoa, quinoa is about its adaptation in the different ecosystem of South America with human migration. And today we have five major ecotypes adapted to the different ecosystem conditions from sea level to more than uh, 1,500 uh, meters above sea level. And it is important to see from this adaptation, quinoa is now used everywhere in the planet for the consumer. But if we go to the genetic diversity and genetic variability of the crop, we see that the sea level ecotype is the most important for adaptation outside the Andes. So it is very difficult for people who want to adapt quinoa in other country to use the variety, the local variety from altitude, from the altiplano from North Chile, North Argentina, or Bolivia and Peru. The quinoa expansion has trends and limits. And if we go directly to this, we can see that uh, <clears throat> until the 80s, only South America and uh, some trials in North America, in Mexico, and United States are only known. But after the International Year of Quinoa, many new countries are producers of quinoa all around the world. But what is the most important condition to develop this expansion of the crop. And one important thing is about collaboration across farmers, about research, university, research institute. And this collaboration is important. For example, the collaboration with the university in England was the first 
network of Kino Europe experimentation at global level. The second one with, with, was linked to the Danina cooperation in Denmark with a CIP FL project during the 90s with all the chemo experimentation all around the world. And today we can see the importance of the number of countries always growing at global level and the links we need to maintain across the different countries. Why do we need to maintain links between the uh, countries of origin of the crop and the new countries? Because it is a question of fair access to genetic resources. And we can see in this map that Peru and Bolivia are the main gen banks for conservation of many accession of the crop. But we have also many, many small gen banks all around the world that can be used to test some quinoa accession in different countries. The second important thing is a question of access to scientific knowledge. And for example, we can see in this map again that uh, past research on quinoa were always about South America condition. But today we have more and more new publication about quinoa adaptation in different countries. And it could be interesting to link some researchers from South America to the new experimentation to share experiences, knowledge, and to give them the possibility to learn from the new experimentation of quinoa at South the Andes. Another problem is a question of access to technologies and uh, collaboration gives the possibility to, <clears throat> to give the access to new technology to different developing countries in uh, international projects. In conclusion, it is more a question of sustainable development, the adaptation of quinoa in different countries, and we have to think about improving resource efficiency to secure equity and responsibility in our cooperation, research collaboration, and to strengthen resilience for farming systems. I have developed five years ago a global collaboration network on quinoa, GCM quinoa. The objective of this global collaborative network is to create a shared vision and action plan for the future of quinoa beyond its origin. And we develop many publications, open access publications, to share all the information we develop and we propose to all the scientists who are interested with this crop. And the vision of this global collaborative network will serve as a tool to foster the development of inclusive, respectful, responsible, and ethical quinoa programs and projects all over the world. And the global dimension of this initiative is of high importance to connect Indian countries to new country producers in order to avoid conflicts by generating more mutual interstanding and partnerships. And we have five main objectives for this network to support the co development and exchange of technology to multiple stakeholders, to promote access to a wide range of technology for conservation, characterization, evaluation, and sustainable use of kinogenic resources to support South-South cooperation as a tool for technical assistance and to facilitate the emergence of the Indian Kino Farmer Network for establishing strategic linkages between farmers and research networks. This is why we want to develop a common participatory research agenda. And now in this network, we have more than 300 members from 75 countries. The main conclusion of my presentation is that there is a great potential to contribute to worldwide food security with quinoa. Varietal and environment differences in the contents of nutrients, biodegradable compounds, and sapori are considerable in quinoa and need to be studied more in depth. And it is important to facilitate the informed decision making concerning the use of quinoa data on nutrition composition of quinoa under different conditions are necessary. And we need more flexible genetic material with the potential to maintain yield stability while continually evolving in response to change like climate. 
and the global correlated network called Tinoa could be the vector to disseminate and test evolutionary material in your environment. And the key message I want to you to take home is that access to quinoa germplasm and benefit sharing from its utilization should be addressed. Recognizing the hard work of Indian people in the selection and conservation of local quinoa land races, maintaining and adding value to quinoa's biodiversity through diversification for the benefit of global food security and poverty reduction. And quinoa is more than on your crop. Its biodiversity is at her heart on the innovative agri-food system that can really inspire for spread. And we need to continue to eat biodiversity to help preserve it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I say uh, un grand merci uh, to Dr. Basil. Um, and uh, thank you for your involvement in uh, Quinoa. I am personally uh, a beneficiary, I think, of your work as my nutritionist uh, is recommending uh, Quinoa. I don't know it, if it is from uh, native uh, countries or from some adapted um, crops in some other countries, but uh, well, thank you. And uh, 